Good morning. morning. Today we mark the festival of the Lutheran Reformation. We thank God for how he used the gospel so long ago to bring changes to his church here on the earth, and we praise the Lord for the reform he continually works in us through that same gospel. We'll offer the Lord our worship by following the service as outlined in our service folder. We'll begin by singing Martin Luther's famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let's all stand. We'll sing stanzas one through three and then stanza four a little bit later. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. 
We thank and praise the Lord for the saving truths of the gospel revealed in the Holy Scriptures. God tells us that the truths of his word will last forever. The Apostle Peter writes, All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. Jesus himself declares, Heaven and earth will pass away. So let us cling to God's word, the source of life and peace, as Jesus encourages us. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Let us pray. Almighty God, through the preaching of Martin Luther and the other reformers, you cause the light of the gospel to shine brightly. Grant that we may faithfully hold to your gospel and joyfully proclaim it for the saving of people and to the glory of your holy name. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. O living God, we stand together in your presence, bringing no merit or worthiness of our own. We can claim no goodness in ourselves, for we believe what your word plainly says about us. Because we are sinful and without our own righteousness and holiness, we must cling to another righteousness, one from you, and to which your word testifies. Believe what the word says to you about this righteousness from God. You are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. He demonstrated his justice by punishing Jesus instead of you. Because God was just in laying all your guilt on his son, he now justifies you. Thanks to Christ's sacrificial death, God pronounces you not guilty of sin. We sing stanza four. You may be seated. The first lesson from God's Word is also the basis for the sermon today from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 18. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Get up and go down to the potter's house. And there I will reveal my words to you. So I went down to the potter's house, and he was making something on the wheel. But the pot he was forming out of the clay was ruined as he shaped it with his hands. So the potter formed it into a different pot, whatever he saw fit to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me. House of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. See, like clay in the potter's hands, that is what you are in my hands, house of Israel. 
One time I may say that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed. But if that nation I spoke about repents of its evil, then I will relent and not bring the disaster I had planned to bring against it. Another time I may say that a nation or a kingdom is to be built and planted. But if they do what is evil in my sight by not listening to my voice, then I will not bring about the good I said I would do for them. Now therefore, say this to the men of Judah and to those who live in Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. Look, I am forming a disaster against you. I am devising a plan against you. Turn from your evil ways, each of you, and reform your ways and your actions. This is the word of the Lord. We sing the psalm for Reformation Sunday, Psalm 46. It is printed out on page 84 in the front part of the hymn. The second scripture lesson is found in the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 14. It is a part of a vision representing people like Martin Luther and Christians of every age that proclaim the gospel of peace through Jesus. Then I saw another angel flying in the middle of the sky. He had the everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the sky, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. We hear the anthem by the school children.
Please stand for the reading of the Gospel lesson. We read from Jesus' sermon about the end of the world recorded in Mark 13. Right now we live in the end times. And many of the things that Jesus describes are happening right in front of us. But we aren't always focused on the good news of salvation through Jesus and to faithfully proclaim that message until Jesus comes again. Jesus began by telling them, Be careful that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will deceive many. Whenever you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled. Such things must happen, but the end is not yet. In fact, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. But be on your guard. People will hand you over to councils and you will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand in the presence of rulers and kings for my sake as a witness to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Whenever they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand what you should say. Say whatever is given to you in that hour, because you will not be the one speaking. Instead, it will be the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Little children are invited to come up to the front for the children's message. Come on up. Come on up, guys. Good morning to all of you. So I brought something along today that you probably have all played with before. It's just a little bitty one. Solomon, you'd recognize this. This is actually yours. This is is Play-Doh. How many of you have played with Play-Doh before? Yeah, me too. I used to love it as a kid. So Play-Doh is pretty cool because once you take it out, you can make all kinds of stuff with it, right? And you can make trees. You can make a little person. You can make dogs or snakes out of it if you roll it out flat, right? Well, I'm not going to make anything fancy today. I'm just going to make... Mike just went off. I'm just going to make a ball. Now there it is. Now let's say as I make this ball, I don't really like how it looks. I, it's too lumpy. I want it to be more round. Well, here's the cool thing about Play-Doh. If I've made a mistake, I can just mush it flat and I can start all over again and make something brand new out of it, right? That's awesome with Play-Doh. We are kind of like this Play-Doh. God took us and he made us. You know that? God made each and every one of you. He made you just the way you are. And now when God made us, he wanted us to be people who love Jesus, who listen to his word, and always trust him. But you know what happens? Instead of being just how God made us, sometimes we're a little bit lumpy. We don't look quite like God wants us to look. Not on the outside, but on the inside. On the inside, we don't always love Jesus like we should. We don't always love God's Word and trust Him like we should. And so what God does, He mushes us flat spiritually. He leads us to be sorry for our sins and then through the message that all of our sins are forgiven, He begins to remake us. He reforms us. Through trusting in Jesus, he makes us to be the people that he wants us to be. Let's pray and ask that God would always continually make us to be as he wants us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we confess that we are wonderfully made by you, that you made us special and you made us in love. But Jesus, we also confess that we don't love you like we always should, and we're sorry. We'd ask that through your word, You continue to make us into the kind of people you want us to be. People who love you, who know you died for our sins, and who trust in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, friends.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Dear friends in Christ, let's consider the words of the prophet Jeremiah in our time together this morning. Jeremiah the prophet was given a series of object lessons to go along with the words that he received from the Lord and the words that he was to share with the people of Israel. The text that we have before us to consider is the second object lesson that Jeremiah received in his book. And in this object lesson that he gets, there is a strong message of law, which means God speaks clearly about sin and also speaks clearly about what would happen because of the sin. But even though there is this strong message of law, there is still this subtle, unshakable reminder that God has love and mercy and that he desires to save. In the object lesson for today, we see God's desire to save in that he doesn't just toss sinners to the side in frustration, but rather he seeks to reform them. And he reforms us not in the sense that he just makes us look better on the outside, shapes us differently, but reforms in the sense that he makes us into something completely new. And so today we see that it is God who reforms. And that was true for Israel. It was true for Martin Luther. It's true for you and me as well. Jeremiah, at the start of our lesson, goes down to the potter's house. And he watches the potter make a pot. So with his feet, he's spinning the bottom wheel and the top, the top wheel spinning. There's a lump of clay on it. The potter takes his hands, puts it on the clay, and he begins to fashion a vessel. Very common in Jeremiah's day. In fact, one pastor wrote in his sermon that clay pots were kind of like the Tupperware of ancient Israel. So this is a very common practice to see this. But something bad happens as Jeremiah watches this potter fashioning the pot with his hands. Either there is some flaw in the clay, maybe there's a stone in it and it digs in deep, or maybe the clay doesn't hold its shape. We're not sure what it is, but somehow the clay becomes marred. The pot is useless. So instead of just flinging the clay off the wheel and grabbing new perfect clay, the potter mashes it down and he begins to reform that same clay into a new vessel, into a brand new pot, pot, something that will work. And that is the image, the object lesson that God gave to Jeremiah. Now the point is this. All things, every nation, especially the nation of Israel, is like clay in the potter's hands, is like clay in God's hands. Like clay, God fashioned the nation of Israel. From that lump of Abraham's family line, God made a people of his very own. He made this great nation. He brought them out of slavery in Egypt, brought them to the desert. And in the desert, God made an agreement with them. He said, you will obey me and be my people and I will be your God. And then God gave that nation its very own promised land. And God made this nation for a very special purpose. Out of all the nations on the world, Israel was to be the one to carry the revealed word of God. No other nation had it. He gave it to his people Israel. And Israel had another very special purpose. They were to carry the line and the promise of the coming Savior of the world. What a special promise, that, or what a special reason that God fashioned this nation of Israel. But then Israel became marred. They became marred with sin. By the time the prophet Jeremiah came onto the scene to start serving Israel, they had already faced so much devastation and so much destruction because of sin. At one time, Israel was this nation, this one group of people united in their love and their praise and their worship of God, their trust for God. But then Israel's heart turned away from the Lord and they asked for a king. 
And then they sinned more, and the king sinned, and the kingdom became divided so that there were two kingdoms, a north and a south. And then the people in the north, who at one time loved God and worshipped only Him, their hearts turned away from God, and they worshipped false gods. Many gods they began to embrace. The Lord called them to repent, but they refused. So God brought the Assyrian army down, and the northern kingdom was completely wiped off the map. They were destroyed. All that was left was Judah, the southern kingdom, which is where Jeremiah lived. And when Jeremiah came upon the scene, even the people of Judah were starting to repeat the same sins, the same mistakes as the northern tribe had done, the northern kingdom. Their hearts were turning away from God. And yet God's goal was not to just discard them in frustration and to start over. He wanted to reform them. He wanted to bring them to repentance. And so he gave a message to Jeremiah to speak to the people. And he gave Jeremiah an object lesson. And here's the message through this lesson and through the words of Jeremiah. Here's what God said to the people of Israel. Israel, you have sinned. You are like marred clay. You're not doing what you were supposed to do. And so I need to reform you. And I would much rather remake you into a vessel that will contain my mercy and grace rather than to remake you into a vessel into which I will pour my wrath and anger. So Israel, turn from your sin, repent, turn back to the Lord, and I will not bring upon you the disaster I was planning. That was the message. Now you know what Judah did with it. They didn't listen. Judah did not turn back. They did not repent of their sin. And so God used the Babylonian army as that hand that would mush the clay flat. And it was taken off into captivity. But even while Israel was in captivity, the hands of the potter never left that lump of clay. And God continued to work and to fashion that lump that was knocked flat. Eventually, he even brought a small remnant back to Israel and continued to refashion them so that they could carry out their purpose, so that the Savior could be born through them. Today, we are celebrating the Reformation. And if you think about the message to Jeremiah and the Reformation, you might jump ahead of me and already conclude that the visible church on earth at the time, the Roman church, was that lump of clay that needed to be reformed because of sin and false teaching in the Reformation. Now let's remember, however, that the visible church on earth was the byproduct, the result of the work of God's prophets and apostles, his evangelists during the New Testament. As the apostles went out and shared the good news of Jesus, people started to gather around that message. It brought groups of people together. So this church was a good thing. This church was established so that it could keep the gospel of Jesus Christ spreading, so that it would be taught in its truth and purity. It was meant to be a people that would reflect the light of Christ into the darkness of this world. That was the point of the visible church. But it became marred with sin and false teaching. And you see that evident in Luther's day. You see that it became marred with false teaching when the elected leader of that visible church claimed to have sole authority of Christ, in fact, even to stand in the place of Christ here on earth. You see that it was marred with false teaching in the, in the fact that the church of Luther's day taught that for a small sum of money, souls could be purchased for God. You see it needed to be reformed in the fact that the church taught that if you did the right things, and if you did enough good things, then you could earn God's love and favor. The church had become marred. It needed to be reformed. Now many people think of Martin Luther as that hand that God used to reform the church. And through Luther, that message, that central message of Scripture 
that we are reconciled to God through Christ and Christ alone. It's what Jesus did, not what we do, that brings us peace with God. It's true that that message came to light under Luther, but before that could ever happen, God needed to first reform Martin Luther. See, Martin Luther was a product of the culture of his time. Young Martin Luther saw God as angry, vengeful, full of wrath. Young Luther couldn't see how a holy God could ever love imperfect people. Now, unlike the people of his day, though, Luther took that seriously. Luther took his spiritual condition before God seriously. And he wanted to get right with God, but he first tried to do that on his own terms. So Luther ran off and joined the monastery, became a monk. And then Luther became a priest, said masses, said prayers. Luther held dear everything the church said was valuable, good, and important. And Luther did all of that, hoping that somehow he might earn God's love, at least just a little drop of it. That's the young Luther. Later on in life, Luther began to realize that before he did any of those things, God already loved him. God loved him in eternity. It was God who formed Luther in his mother's womb. It was God who called Luther to be his own child through the waters of holy baptism. Now true, Luther was a marred lump of clay, like you and me, marred with the sin of self-righteousness, work righteousness, and he too needed to be reformed. And God did that through the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Luther was studying the book of Romans, he stopped seeing God as this angry, vengeful God and began to see God as loving, merciful, and even giving In fact, Luther discovered that whatever God makes a demand of us, he graciously and fully supplies to us in Christ. So that if God demands that we be righteous, which he does, he supplies that righteousness to us through Christ, through faith in him. So through faith in Jesus, you all have that righteousness that God demands so that you can stand before God in his sight and be right with him. When Luther saw God as a loving and giving God, it changed his heart. He was reformed. Luther even says reborn in a sense. And then that reformed Luther, God used him to then help reform the visible church. God is the one who reforms. It's true of Luther and it's also true of you and me as well. Lumps of clay. It's not a bad picture if it's referring to us, lumps of clay. After all, God did make us out of the dust of the ground. That's what the first book of the Bible tells us. Can you imagine that? God forming Adam out of the dust of the ground? Can you imagine God taking his time carefully carving out Adam's nose? I'm sure Adam must have been some masterpiece. But then again, so are you. God has formed you. Like clay in his hands, God has made you just the way you are. Scripture tells us in Psalm 139, You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. We have been formed in love by Almighty God. Sadly, we don't always see it that way, do we? Especially as we look at our own bodies, we might say, well, God, if you made me, I would have liked to have been a little taller, maybe a little thinner, maybe a little more hair. But the truth is, we are God's handiwork. He has formed us in love. And God made Adam and Eve in love, too. He made them perfect. And that's how he wanted them to stay. But Adam and Eve, sadly, listened to Satan instead of God. And they disobeyed God and brought sin into the world. When Adam and Eve ate of that forbidden fruit, they became marred lumps of clay. And from Adam and Eve come 
more marred lumps of clay. Because every single human being born in the natural way after Adam and Eve have inherited that original sin of our first parents. God originally made people to value what He values, which is His Word, His Son, and the souls of other people. But because we are marred with sin, we often value what the world values. Money, power, and pleasure. Because we are marred with sin, instead of being people who are generous, we struggle with greed. Because we're marred with sin, instead of willingly helping other people, we like others to beg us for help because then it makes us feel powerful. Because we are marred with sin, instead of living a quiet, disciplined life with God at the center, we like to live that fast, loose, carefree life with our own pleasures at the very center of it. And what should God do with us then? Marred lumps of clay that we are. Should he just throw us off his workbench and grab some other better clay and start working with that? That's not what the potter did when Jeremiah was watching him. And that's not what God does with you and me. Instead of discarding us, he reforms us by his grace. God makes us into something new. He makes us into vessels to receive his mercy and his love. And repentance is key in that reformation that God does with us. See, the message that we are sinners, sinners that deserve God's wrath and his punishment, that message knocks us flat. It mushes us down to be what we might think of as spiritual lumps of clay. And that being humbled is something that only God can do. That is the work of the Holy Spirit through God's law, through his message of sin and its punishment. And once God knocks us flat, once he humbles us, there is nothing we can do to improve our condition. No amount of self-loathing and self-hatred feeling bad is going to change it. No amount of extraordinary works and good deeds is going to change it. The same God who humbled us has to be the one who will also remake us. And God reforms us, the same we did with Luther, through the message of Jesus Christ. Through this message. That the eternal Son of God, by the Holy Spirit, was formed in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And he was formed there so that he could take our place, be our substitute under God. The Son of God became clay, unmarred, in God's hands. And he did that so that he could live in a way that you and I could not live. And he did that so that he could suffer what he should not have to suffer. And all of that Jesus did so that you and I can stand before God as unmarred vessels and receive his mercy and his love for all eternity. That is the reforming work that God does in us through the gospel. I think also it's important for us, however, to hear Jeremiah's warning today. God tells us through Jeremiah that if the Lord is forming, making someone for good, and that person should turn away from God, if that nation should reject God and no longer follow Him, then God will rethink the good He's doing. In fact, He'll bring upon that person destruction and punishment. Last week, Pastor Ewings talked to us about, about the cross currents that exist in our lives. And what that means is this. Even though we are being remade in Christ, being made to be vessels to receive God's mercy and love, it is also true that we still carry around this sinful flesh. And this sinful flesh would love nothing more than for us to be marred. For us to be people who would receive God's judgment instead of his mercy and grace. And so what we need is a daily reformation. See, Reformation is to be a daily event, not just a one-time celebration in the church once a year. 
Every day, we need to come into contact with God's holy word so that his spirit can mush us down, bring us to repentance with his law, but then also begin to reform us to be more like Christ through his gospel. Every day, friends, we need to put our hand, ourselves in the hands of God through his word and sacraments. Because as it was with Israel, as it was with Luther, so it is with you and me. God is the one who reforms us. And may he continue to do so every day. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we join in confessing our faith today, we'll actually use one of the articles of the Augsburg Confession, article number three. We speak it together. Our churches teach that the Word, that is, the Son of God, assume the human nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So there are our two natures, the divine and the human, inseparably joined in one person. There is one Christ, true God and true man, who was born of the Virgin Mary, truly suffered, was crucified, died, and was buried. He did this to reconcile the Father to us and to be a sacrifice, not only for original guilt, but also for all actual sins of mankind. He also descended into hell and truly rose again on the third day. Afterward, he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. There he forever reigns and has dominion over all creatures. He sanctifies those who believe in him by sending the Holy Spirit into their hearts to rule, comfort, and make them alive. He defends them against the devil and the power of sin. The same Christ will openly come again to judge the living and the dead, and so forth, according to the Apostles' Creed. You may be seated. We, can we stand to pray. Gracious Father, we praise and thank you for every gift that you give to us, especially the gift of your Son and forgiveness of sins through his blood shed on the cross. We ask you to accept these financial gifts that we give to you, a part of all the treasures that you have entrusted to us. Use these gifts for the glory of your name and for the spread of the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray the responsive Reformation prayer as it is printed out in your service folder. We include a prayer on behalf of Scott and Connie Vins, who are celebrating 20 years of marriage. We also pray for Gladys Dietzel, who is scheduled for surgery this, this upcoming Tuesday. Let us pray. O God of our salvation, you have given us the word of truth to lead us from darkness to light, from the threat of eternal death to the hope of eternal life. O God the Father, because of your eternal love, you sent your one and only Son into the world to take on our flesh and to carry our sin. O God the Son, you willingly humbled yourself to accept the shame of humanity and to endure the pain of suffering to the point of death so that we might be spared the judgment to eternal condemnation. O God, the Holy Spirit, through the everlasting gospel, you have declared us just in your sight through the blood of Christ and credited to us his righteousness through faith in him. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gift of marriage through which you bring many blessings to your children here on earth. We praise you for giving Scott and Connie Vins 20 years of married life. You have shown them your grace and love in countless ways. Through their Christian companionship, they have loved, helped, and supported one another. 
Keep your hand of blessing over them and their Christian marriage. We also ask you to watch over Gladys Dietzel as she undergoes surgery on Tuesday. Guide the surgeon and all who attend in the operation. Bless her with a good recovery. We thank you for your ongoing kindness and mercy to Gladys. Fill her with gospel comfort and the peace she has with you through your Son, her Savior. O Holy Trinity, we thank you for the privilege of observing the Lutheran Reformation and for the heritage of your word, of your word and its truth and purity. We rejoice in the hope of heavenly glory by Christ alone, by grace alone, by scripture alone, and by faith alone. Gracious Savior, you gave your body and shed your blood to redeem us from sin, death, and the devil. We praise you for the gift of your supper in which you give us your body and blood to eat and to drink. Enrich us through this meal, strengthen our faith in you, and increase our love for one another. We pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. We sing the closing hymn. Special thanks to our children from TSL, director, accompanist, and teachers for using your gifts and talents to glorify Jesus on Reformation Sunday. Please look through the bulletin. There are a number of inserts on events coming up this month in the month of November. We are beginning a new adult Bible class this morning on the afterlife. Today we'll begin with a study of what Christ has rescued us from, hell. We will be returning our adult Bible class downstairs into the room, so after you grab some snacks and catch up with some Christian friends, please come on downstairs. God's blessings on your day and your week ahead.